Here we go. All right, everybody on your best behavior. We're recording. <laughs> Okay, um, let's go right to the opening prayers. Wow, okay. Uh, we'll do it, we'll do it as we have been. Um, we'll say it once, the, the Tibetan ones, we'll say it once in English, and then uh, we'll sing them twice in the Tibetan. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by listening to teachings and the other paramitas, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye Shudang Soki Choknam La Jang Chu Bardu Dagni Kyapsu Shi Dagi Jin Soki Pe Sonam Ki Drola Penchir Sangye Drupal Shu Sangye Chudang Soki Choknam La Jang Chu Bardu Dagni Kyapsu Shi Dagi jin so gi pe so nam ki ro la pin chir The next are the four immeasurable thoughts and, and um, concentrate on these as we say them because this is going to be part of uh, the, one of the mantras that we'll be discussing today. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Then on the top of the second page is the seven limb prayer where we visualize the Buddha and all the bodhisattvas and high, highly realized beings as well as our spiritual teachers in the space in front of us as we say this prayer. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind and present clouds of every type of offering actual and mentally transformed. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings. <clears throat> Please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. That seven limb prayer also has a, a the, uh, talks about declaring negative actions accumulated since beginningless time. That's directly related to another one of the mantras that we'll be discussing today. Then we do the mandala offering. <clears throat> Drum re rabbling Nide again, Sang Idam Guru Ratna Bandala Kam Niriyatai. So today, uh, before we get to, uh, back to the actual text of, of Narvajunas and, and where he's going next is a, um, is a is an actual practice where we we practice uh, 
the 10 virtuous actions and avoiding the 10 negative actions. And so there's a lot in that practice which we can use uh, the mantras for, which is why I want to talk about the mantras now and, and how the mantras uh, can protect our mind and, and what that actually means uh, to protect our mind. So first off, I want to talk about the importance of setting a compassionate motivation for our Dharma practice. All of the great spiritual masters tell us that meditating on emptiness, by meditating on emptiness, we can remove all the suffering of cyclic existence at its root. We can eradicate, eradicate suffering and cyclic existence at its root. What, is this, what this means is that if we meditate with the intention of being liberated from cyclic existence, we can eradicate what are called the afflictive obscurations. Afflictive obscurations are um, all of the emotional, um, troublesome, habitual tendencies in our mind uh, and mental continuums that give rise to all of our disturbing attitudes, uh, anger, attachments, you name it. All of the disturbing attitudes arise from, from this and um, as well as our grasping at everything, all phenomena as if it truly existed out there the way it appears to us. These, these are the afflictive obscurations on our clear light mental continuum. Our, the nature of our, our, of our mind is actually pure clarity and awareness. But now, right now it is obscured. Our mental continuum is obscured with all these afflictive, what they call afflictive obscurations. And this is what keeps us in samsara, in cyclic existence. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, additionally to that, additionally to the afflictive obs obscurations, if our meditation practice is motivated by bodhicitta, which on the bodhisattva path, this is what we are training to do. So from the very beginning, we're, we're developing this motivation to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. That's what bodhicitta means. It means awakened heart and mind, heart, mind, awakened heart, mind, so that we are, it's a combination of compassion with, with wisdom. Mm -hmm. and, and it's to, it's to, so that is, if we, if we meditate on emptiness with that bodhicitta motivation, the thing that we can eradicate is, are what are called the um, cognitive obscurations, cognitive obscurations. And these are, um, these are adventitious or extraneous stains that kind of cover over our clear light mental continuum and uh, keep us from having a um, realization of, of the unity of conventional phenomena and ultimate phenomena. That conventional and phenomena and ulti ultimate phenomena actually are, come together in our one thing. And, but our cognitive obscurations keep us from being able to even see that or be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So the, when we meditate on emptiness with this intention to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, this is what will actually bring us to a point where we can finally remove those cognitive ob obscurations and, compl and attain complete awakening to the omniscience of Buddhahood, the omniscience of enlightenment. And in this way, it, it will enable us to have the full capacity to totally relieve the suffering of others and bring them to a lasting state of well-being and happiness. This is why our motivation is very, very important. All of the truths that the Buddha reveals in his teachings have compassion at their root. Compassion is right at the root of his teachings. Um, for those of us on the uh, Mahayana path, the path that the Bodhisattva path is the Mahayana path, the path that will take us all the way to enlightenment, great compassion is essential. It's essential to that path. Compassion is a state of mind that has the intention to help others 
to a state of well-being and relieve their suffering and protect them from suffering. Mm -hmm. If compassion fills our hearts, we will naturally and automatically want to help other beings. We will want to protect them, keep them from suffering. If you think about it, if, if every being, if every living being had compassion in their heart, our world, the world would be pervaded with joy and happiness. Yeah. Pervaded with it. I'm talking every being. If that, if that actually was the case, joy and happiness would reign. And what that is, what that tells us is that compassion actually is the root, the root of joy and happiness. So to follow the Buddha's path is to follow compassion and to follow the path of compassion. But compa compassion alone is not sufficient. It is, it is um, necessary. It is essential. But it is not the only thing. Christopher, yeah. I have to interrupt you because I'm reminded of the first question I ever asked in a Buddhist teaching, and it's coming up now. I understand this, but how do you get compassion? We're just laying out the motivation here. I'm just saying. Kavita, we all have compassion. It's very nice to say, let's all be compassionate, but we all know. That I was just about to say, compassion alone is not sufficient. Compassion it's essential. Come by itself. We're just so yes. accustomed to self We have to combine it with wisdom. We have to. I think, in my opinion, it has to be cultivated through wisdom. Exactly. This is where we're going. So you're and right on the mark here. I just, it's... But compassion is, is when we have true grounded compassion that's grounded in wisdom and the understanding of the nature of reality, that mm -hmm. compassion is unlimited. Mm -hmm. Right now, our compassion is, is not that way. <laughs> Regular sentient beings, the compassion is only for what we want, what we care about, what we think is mine. And we, we want everybody to else to go to hell, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> Who's, you know, oh, blocking them. You know, I'm going to fix this poor lady, help her across the street, and I'm going to, the bird has a broken wing. and Right. And I the mean, bird winds up dying while you're trying to save it. Right? We need the wisdom. That's, we need the wisdom in order for it to work. This is why... It, I, Kenshi Drogba used to say that we can't have compassion. We won't have valid compassion until our wisdom is increased. Valid, that's right. We will be unstable. The compassion will be unstable. But we all do have some compassion. We have compassion for those who we, we care about. You know, we have compassion for our pets when, when they're acting the way we like. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I mean, is that how it works right right now for um, just regular old sentient beings like us? Mm. Our compassion doesn't have the wisdom combined with it because we don't understand what that wisdom what that wisdom means, what what it's talking about. So this is why the Buddhist path, the uh, the path to enlightenment, has these two uh, wings to it. It has the compassion wing and the wisdom wing. And these have kept these the compassion wing and the wisdom wing eventually they come together in a in a sort of a non-dual, you could say a non-dual wing of the path, mm -hmm. where they're they like I talked about before, they merge like when you're looking at a stereoscopic picture and you have right. two things from different angles. Well, you focus in the right way and they merge completely together so you can see the whole picture. And compassion and wisdom together make the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so this just reminds me of the three principal aspects of the path by Sankarpa. Mm -hmm. Where is he in relation to Nargajuna? Sankarpa, you mean? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of what you're describing... Sankarpa followed Nargajuna. Okay. okay. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, relied heavily, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, 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 So an understanding of emptiness is what we need. We need, we need to combine that with the compassion. And the understanding of emptiness leads to what is called the perfection of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, this is um, wisdom is not perfected, 
until there is a, a realization of emptiness. So there are, wisdom is one of six perfections that we talk about. There's the perfection of um, generosity, ethical discipline, patience, enthusiastic effort, and meditative concentration. Then there's wisdom. Those, those other five, they are also not considered perfections until they are combined with the realization of emptiness. Mm -hmm. So in other words, <clears throat> they, they don't even get the name perfection unless they, they are combined with a realization, unless our generosity is combined with an understanding, a realization of emptiness, mm -hmm. unless our, um, um, our discipline is combined with that understanding. Right. That's what makes them perfect. So this is a very, very high, when we get to that level of perfection, it's, it's a very, very high level on the path. And this is what we are training ourselves to, to do, to understand. So this is why this perfection of wisdom is so important when you combine it with the, the compassion. Um, the perfection of wisdom is so-called because it leads us um, beyond psychic existence to the transcendent state of liberation. And what, what is liberation? It is a state of existence in which we are completely free of the seemingly endless cycle of birth, aging, sickness, and death. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a condition in which we are, well, you know, uh, Genlam Rinpa has a very, I love the way he puts this. He says, to attain liberation from psychic existence is like leaving the gravitational force of the earth in a spaceship. <laughs> so that, so if you think of it in those terms, we're free from that gravitation, that pull mm -hmm. of psychic existence once we're liberated from it. And we're liberated from psychic existence by a move, removing, pulling from their root, what, what I talked about, the aff afflictive obscurations. Yeah. Those are the those are the um, emotional uh, <clears throat> clinging, grasping, think, thinking things exist inherently and grasping onto it and all the afflictive emotions that arise because of that. Ego self-grasping. -grasp These are the afflictive obscurations. So we are free of those. We're free of the gravitational pull of samsara once we've achieved that liberation. And that then enables us to continue on the path and go through the remaining levels that bring us to the full enlightenment of full omniscient enlightenment of a Buddha. And that's when we remove the cognitive obscurations, those very, very subtle stains that are on our clear light um, continuum, the continuum of our clear light consciousness. That's how we, that's that is sort of the path, removing the afflictive obscurations first and then the cognitive obscurations. So it's important to realize the importance of uh, the perfection of wisdom, because it's it's the thing, like you said, Kavit, is the thing that will make our compassion valid, make our compassion strong. And it will be compassion for all, all beings, regardless of how they're behaving or appearing. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a phenomenal thing if you think about it, because we, well, we're just not there. In our families, we're not there. You know, in our politics, we're not there. The, in the world, we're not there. Right. This is what we're working on. We're working on, we're, our path as a bodhisattva is to get to the point, ultimately get to the point where it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Biden or your mother-in-law they are all, you have valid, stable compassion for all of them. You, you wish them the best and all you want to do is to help them. Mm -hmm. That's all you want to do. And that's just an amazing, amazing thing, really. So now we're going to talk a, a, a little bit more about uh, wisdom, faith, and the law of karma, because this, this came up last week in our discussions and it's important that we get a, I think we came to a pretty good, view of how to do this. <laughs> um, uh, we have to, what, what Narkajuna is, is telling us is that we have to have what he calls faith or confidence in the Buddhist teachings and the practices that he gave us to clean up, you know, all of our negative karma. 
and, and also to develop our positive karma. So the question comes up, well, how can we have faith in something that we don't even know about karma. It's very obscure to us. We don't even understand how that works. How can we have faith that the Buddha is telling, what the Buddha is telling us is something we can follow? And there is another word which I like, and I was looking at the etymology of it just this morning, confidence. And confidence is a kind of self-trust mm -hmm. that one one's own self has the, has the certainty about something. Mm -hmm. So how do we gain that? How can we possibly do that when the Buddha is telling us, or we're being told we need to have faith in the Buddha's teachings in order to develop, to progress on this path? So I think maybe it was Anne or Kavita or a combination of us all who came up with the idea to look at the Buddha more as if he's a scientist and he's presenting a, a hypothesis, <clears throat> hypothesis to us about how things work and so the way you would do this and, and then if you think about it um the buddha actually is like a um a scientist of um psychology psychology is uh the study of the the mind and the mental processes and how those processes uh color our um our behavior and our emotions this is what buddhism is all about mm -hmm. you know and what the buddha is so that's his expertise his expertise is psychology, really. Mm -hmm. So we take his hypothesis of here's what you need to do. Here's what you should try out. So what we should do is we should try it out. Since we don't understand how karma works, we were too obscured to, to be able to even figure that one out. The Buddha is telling us, this expert psychologist is telling us, try these, try these particular exercises. You know, mm -hmm. try, try these, try doing these uh Try eliminating these negative qualities of body, speech, and mind. Try developing these positive qualities of body, speech, and mind, and see how it, see how it works for you. Mm -hmm. It's up to us. Like uh, right. Venerable Ravina says, you're the boss. Nobody is forcing us to do this. Nobody is forcing us to have faith in the Buddha. Blind faith. Blind faith is, that word is such a trigger because blind faith conjures up all kinds of religious dogma, mm -hmm. which would many of us have have sort of revolted against, right, right. because it, the blind faith, the, you don't see the, the evidence of it actually mm -hmm. working. So His Holiness even says, if something is not working for you, forget it. Mm -hmm. so, so in Buddhism, they're saying, you don't have to take somebody's word for it. You develop that confidence yourself, that certainty within yourself. Try out the hypothesis and see if it works for you. See if you are, are making changes. See if your attachment and your anger and your, um, your confusion begins to lessen by practicing, doing these practices. Mm -hmm. See if your, your love and your compassion and your wisdom is growing because of doing these practices, then you will have the certitude within your own being. You will have confidence that these practices are working. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the way, that is the way for us Westerners, for sure, to look mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. Does that, does that it makes make sense. sense? How about for you, Brian? Does that make sense at all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, you get it. Perfect. Yeah. It's a science as, of the mind. As, as a science, as yeah. a scientist. If you think about it, it's, true. it's a science of the mind. Yeah. And everything that entails. We, all of our emotions, all of our faith. Faith of science is the problem. Yeah, but the what happens with science is we try out the hypothesis. If it works, then you have confidence in that yeah, hypothesis. Sure. Yeah. And then you move on. And I think mm -hmm. the faith is like Chris was just said, it's not a blind faith. You know, you have you have to have faith that okay. This worked for Buddha. You know, he did these things. That's what he says. You yeah. know, so it worked for me. Don't know you try it out. So you have to, so to start, you have to have maybe not blind faith, but just some faith that, okay, this is something that could work. It worked for him, her. Maybe it'll work for me too. And then you do that due diligence of 
testing out the hypothesis. Yeah. Most of us have tried everything else, you exactly. know, right. drugs, alcohol, <laughs> sex, power, you know, what's going to make me happy, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we all, we all find that, you know, these things, in the end, they, they, they just cycle back around to causing trouble. Yeah. Um, so why not give this a shot? Right. If it doesn't work right. for you, you'll find something that works for you. Right. Because you know? I think that's the only thing for me. That was the only kind of like, oh, let's give it a try. Yeah. You know? um, Chris, the, I was just going to comment that, uh, not that we all need more reading, but um, but <laughs> the Dalai Lama a great book just called The Middle Way, um, Faith Grounded in Reason, and and uh, hmm. it, which addresses this exact thing and it was really helpful for me but but something that Geshe Nima has has said to me on multiple occasions is is the importance of logic too is that um and uh you know it isn't a blind faith it's 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 logic is absolutely key and and it's okay to and and you know we you covered that in in Shanti Davis chapter on anger and stuff. It's, it's these very logical arguments about. And so when you really spend time with it, it you know, it's like, it's like math. I and mean, when I took math, I did, you know, I had to believe to some extent that the teacher knew what they were taught. Cause I didn't understand algebra. I didn't understand. Yeah. You know? It's like, so you have to start somewhere, but then you, you slowly build a sort of logical reasoning that starts to make sense and that you can test. And, and that's kind of how it works with all of this. It, it's true. Th there is a little bit of a jump um, based on authority in the beginning, but, um, but then you test it. And if it doesn't work, you're free to walk away. <laughs> that's true. You yeah. know, if you think of anything, it's not just math. It's not just Buddhism. Yeah. I mean, uh, music is the same way you trust you trust your music teacher, you figure they must know what they're talking about. And then you right. try the thing out and you develop confidence within yourself. But yeah, this works and there's logic to it. Right. Or or sports even. You have you have mentors who, who will train you or teach you, a coach who will teach you right. how to, you know, throw the ball and get it into the hoop. So you try and you try and you fail and you and eventually you learn exactly how you need to let the ball leave the hand, the kind of amount of force you need to put and the and the angle that the ball will go right. right. That's all reasoning and logic mm -hmm. combined yeah. with motor skills, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's this is the way everything works. So we have to have a little, like you said, uh, trust that, that the teacher knows what they're talking about. And if they don't, leave the class, you know, find another teacher who's, who's, who's right. going to work. It has to be authentic teacher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, and that and your point about logic, it's it's logic will fall into what what we would call the uh, wisdom wing of the path. You know, again, compassion is essential. Without compassion, without compassion, there is no spiritual path. Right. The, there is no spiritual path without compassion because that's what a spiritual path is about. It's about helping others to relieve their suffering and to protect them from suffering. That's a spiritual path. But it requires this training, this logic, this wisdom. So they have to go together like that. So then um, we also, the last time, talked about uh, what makes a stu suitable student for the Buddha's wisdom teachings, these teachings on the perfection of wisdom. And Genlam Rinpa says, to be an appropriate student of these teachings, First, one needs to have confidence in them. Mm -hmm. And we've just talked about that, how to develop that confidence. You kind of have to try it out and right. see. Um, second, second, and this is pretty important. One must be certain of the fact that emptiness does not mean non-existence. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that very, very clearly. Otherwise, we'll make a we'll big mistake. Nihilism. We'll go into nihilism yep. or we'll go into or magical thinking. Right which is, that's exactly what it is. It's just magical thinking. It doesn't work. Um, you know, if I, if I pray it up and I pray it up and say enough mantras, blah, 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 this is going to happen. Yeah. That's not how it works. That's not, what, that's not what we're talking about with mantras. Um, third, one must recognize that actions, relationships, and functions occur even though phenomena are empty of independent, inherent self-existence. So even though phenomena 
are empty of an independent self-existent nature, they do exist in a dependently related fashion. Mm -hmm. That's how things ex exist, in a dependently related fashion. And therefore, activities and functions can be generated mm -hmm. and established. That's how it works. It doesn't... None of this works in a vacuum. None of this works in a self-contained existent something or other. Right. It only works because everything is dependent, interacting. That's what emptiness is talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not conceptually, it's not that difficult to come to an understanding conceptually of what emptiness is talking about, right. especially when you look at the flip side of what it means that everything functions because it is dependent mm -hmm. right so that's the again what i'm representing is really 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 important to be a suitable student for these wisdom teachings to have those understandings i'll say them again the first is to have confidence in the teachings mm -hmm. the second to be certain of the fact that emptiness does not mean utter non-existence and the third is to recognize that actions relationships and functions occur even though phenomena are empty Mm -hmm. of independent self-existence mm -hmm. so is that clear yeah it's important that it's clear uh because it, it would be a, a huge uh, error for us to go further into these these teachings or even these mantras and have the wrong idea mm -hmm. okay yeah. now now we're going to talk about protecting the mind with mantras um, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to use these four mantras that I have, um, that Keshe Nima and I talked about using, um, the Buddha Shakyamuni mantra, the Chenrezig mantra, the Manjushri mantra, and the Vajrasattva mantra. We're going to use them in the context of the teachings and practices that Nargajuna is giving to us. And, and, in, and in actuality, they... They represent, they represent all the, all the aspects of the path to enlightenment. These four mantras are representations of all the aspects of the path. For instance, Buddha Shakyamuni represents the aspect of refuge, taking a safe direction. Then we have Chenrezig, which represents the compassion wing of the path. We have Manjushri, which represents the wisdom wing of the path. And then Vajrasattva represents the union of compassion and wisdom. The, that path, which is the union of compassion and wisdom. So we have the, with these mantras, we have the entire path and a way to connect with the energies of the entire path. And we can use this in our study and practice of the Nagarjuna text. Um, so according to Alexander Berzin, if we analyze the Sanskrit word mantra, the first syllable, man, is short for manas, which means mind. And the second syllable, tra, comes from the Sanskrit verb to save or to protect. So I thought, all right, I'm going to look this up and see, make sure, I'm going to check Alexander Burson, even though I trust him, like, right. you know, yeah. I'm going to check. So I went to this etymology mm -hmm. website in the Sanskrit, and sure enough, man meant mind, and tra meant protect. protect. Protect the mind. So mantra is to protect the mind. Um, this indicates that the reciting of mantras protect our minds from having negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. It protects our minds from negative thoughts, which could then result in negative karmic actions of body, speech, and mind. Because all these karmic actions start with a thought. You know, I am so angry that, you know, so-and-so said this about me. And, so, and then the next thing you know, you're talking about so-and-so mm -hmm. to other people. What a jerk they are. So it's like you get it, you're engaging in divisive speech. And the next thing you know, you got a whole bunch of people going, yeah, that person's an idiot. That person's a jerk. Then when that person walks into the room, you let them have it. So then you have this, you know, you're attacking with your speech. I mean, so the, it all starts with a thought. So the mantras are protecting our mind from negative, negative thoughts, right? And, and they're actually giving us uh, positive 
positive thoughts and 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 um, and true and what would we say valid valid things valid thoughts for our minds to be contemplating and working on so for instance instead of having negative thoughts of disliking others or wishing them harm thoughts which could lead to negative actions of body or speech when we recite the mantra of chenrezi for example it keeps us mindful of love and compassion towards those other beings and so it protects our mind it's interesting that that's what mantra means mind protection so there are many ways in which we can work with mantras but they all fit into the context of training our body speech and mm -hmm. mind for beneficial purposes and protecting us from habitual patterns of body, speech, and mind that are destructive, that harm us and then harm others. So on one level, one level with mantras, we can use our speech in a constructive way. We recite mantras vocally while we imagine a particular Buddha's body either in front of us or working very closely with us or and working closely with the energies of our body. At the same time that that's going on, where our minds are focused on either compassion, clarity of mind, wisdom, or purification of our mind, or whatever the particular Buddha figure is representing. For instance, if with Shakyamuni Buddha, we're focusing on, this is a very safe refuge for me to take, a safe direction for me to take. So we're focusing on, our mind is focusing. So our, 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 and there's a happen, there's energetic things happening with our body. Our, our mouth is speaking these mantras and our mind is focused. So we're working with our body, speech, and mind in a very unified way. This keeps us from, this is, trains us to have focus. It trains us uh, in meditative concentration because the, the, uh, the opposite of meditative concentration is what we do all the time, distraction. Mm -hmm. We're distracted all the time. Something pops into our mind and off we go. Like, you know, huh, here's another race to follow. I mean, we just, we, we have trouble keeping our focus. And the mantras will help us with that. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Because when we, uh, when we internalize, when we understand what all of these Buddha images, the symbolism, what they represent, the energies that they're representing, when we understand what the mantras are actually saying what we're talking about. We kind of embody that. We feel it, and, and it doesn't leave us when we stop the mantras. We begin to carry it with us throughout the day. So everything that we, everything that we interact with becomes mm -hmm. colored by this experience that we're having, this concentrated experience of body, speech, and mind focused on the Dharma. Right. So they're very powerful they're very very effective if we do them properly we do them in the right right frame of mind um and this is again alexander Berzin. he's saying that the deepest level of mantra practice has to do with shaping the subtle energies that are very closely related to the breath in and out the breath the they say the um uh our energies ride on the winds and and i know from other interactions with other people about how western people really don't breathe correctly like you know you, you breathe from a certain place in your diaphragm and not up here mm -hmm. and so many of us i feel like i actually need to learn how to breathe properly because yeah, i've been very shallow breath exactly and so so much is de depending on that proper breath in and out and having these all ride on the winds. And, you know, so I, sometimes I'm like, I need to learn how to breathe. Well, you know that, still breathing like a, you know, like a West. That, that training that we've all been given uh, about before we start like a meditation process, you know, breathe yes. in out, you know, breathe deeply, let the breath out. And you're, you know, you're yeah. visualizing all these things as you do that. And you're, you're, you're moving the energies in your body in, yeah. a, in a harmonious way. Right. So that breathing is about moving the energy in your body throughout right. your energetic system in your body. From the diaphragm, <laughs> not up here. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, you, you know, the um, pranayas that's in the Eastern, Med or Eastern philosophy, mm. we, we do it. 
it's called pranayas, pranayas. meaning the breathing yeah. techniques. Mm -hmm. oh, so okay. there are so many breathing techniques that are really helpful, just like you said, uh, the energy flow. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pranayas that those ancient people have discovered. Um, sure. You know, like a, a lot of Westerners do that too. There's a one one blocking nostril. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you there's so they say we breathe in a regular pattern, but when you close one nostril with this finger and then breathe in and out and then have that cycle going on, your body balances on the energy level. And there's so many. There's another thing I do sometimes, and it seems to help. So basically saying breathing has a lot to do with how we right. feel and yeah. you know, health health and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the so these mantras, we're actually using our, our breath, you know, and we're we're forming energy with these with these syllables. We're forming a kind of energy. And we don't have to you can you can say mantra internally in your mind and it will have some beneficial effect, but it's not going to have the effect on the the breath and the energies. You don't have to say the mantra loudly. You can just, you know. Right, you could right, whisper right. it, but you're still getting that that the energy that the that the mantra is is creating. And when you understand what that energy is, then your mind, your mind knows, your mind knows, and you know your mind is creating this energy and it's going into your whole energetic system through your breath and then back out through your breath so it's they are they are really powerful practices when we understand what mantras are about and how and how to use them and how we are using our energies and where these mantras are coming from you know they're coming from um they're basically coming from the they're an expression or an emanation of an enlightened mind, enlightened body, enlightened speech. Um, so back to Alexander Berzin, um, through, through familiarity and practice with, with saying the mantras and using the breath, we begin to experience the movement of these subtle energies and winds throughout our body. Sometimes, sometimes you'll feel them you know, they'll, they'll be in your feet and then you'll feel it in your knees and then it will feel, you'll feel this energy moving through your whole body. You will feel the energy moving. It, don't expect this to happen right off the bat. I've been doing this for what, 18 years? Right. And now I'm just starting to feel the energy moving. So <laughs> it, it a lot depends on where, where your understanding of, of the whole, the complete Dharma path, how, how, what your grasp is of it right. and your understanding of it, right. which is why just keep going, keep working with it. Right. For all, I mean, somebody could be, had, have done a lot of work in a previous lifetime on just this kind of thing. And so when, as the first time they say a mantra, it's like, boom, you know, it all puts with them. Right. Others have never even, this is totally new. So you'll you'll say the mantra, you'll try the visual relation, but you'll be thinking the thoughts and you're going, I'm not feeling anything. Yeah. <laughs> but just keep persevering, keep trying, because it's through practice. It's like anything. I can't get the ball in the hole. I give up. No, yeah. you don't give up. You know, you you your yeah. coach comes back, your coach encourages you, your coach tells you, try this again, try it in a different way. You know, the coach will work with you and your particular abilities to get, you know, to get the ball in the hole. Right. So just keep trying. Don't give up. His Holiness says, never, never give up. That's not, that's not a, that's, in Buddhism, you never give up. Because the, the, the goal is, is <laughs> so, so wonderful, you know. To give up is to... So to give up is just to go back up. into the cyclic existence and all the confusion and the reflective emotions and blah, blah, blah. You know, so don't, don't give up. Um, so through continued practice and familiarity, we develop methods then for gaining control over those winds and energies. We can, we're able to control where they are in our body. And then by using special types of mantras and special types of advanced practices, we can direct those energies to access our clear light level of mind more easily. The, the, the pure clarity and awareness of our mind. And that at that, this is the level then, this is the level that is most conducive for a direct 
non-conceptual realization of emptiness. If we can access the clear light mind, then we can, that's when we will have the direct realization of emptiness. Okay. And that's the, and that is the gateway to liberation and enlightenment. So when we practice the following mantras, the, the four mantras, in conjunction with mentally imagining the Buddha figures that are associated with them, we have to be mindful of not letting our practice degenerate into conceiving the mantras to be magical incantations and the Buddha figures as beings who are out there or who are going to, um, who have the power to transform us. The way we should think about it is that the Buddha figures and the subtle energy generated through reciting these mantras represent the innate potential of everyone's Buddha nature, of our own Buddha nature. It represents the innate potentials of our own Buddha nature. When we see, when we're visualizing, for instance, Chenrezig, and we're saying the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hong, and visualizing Chenrezig and all this the symbolism of what what compassion is about what we are what we are accessing gaining access to is the own our own innate potential for that energy for for us to actually um manifest that energy and the mantras ena enable you to connect with the the this aspect of buddha buddha nature connect say with <clears throat> compassion the trainer, you know, the, the coach, Chen Rezig, the, the, the Buddha of compassion, is the trainer coaching you how you connect yourself to this. And then you begin to feel that this is part of your own, this is your own Buddha nature that you're developing now. So it's, it's very, very uh, effective, very powerful. Um, so that's how we should be thinking of it, that everyone has the potential ability um, to access their their subtle clear light continuum of consciousness and that subtle light light continuum of consciousness that we have can give rise to to patterns of positive thought and behavior so this is true whether we're our our um clear light mind or clear light consciousness is completely overshadowed or, or covered over by obscurations it still is there and it still has the potential to give rise to all kinds of positive uh, qualities. Our job is to remove remove all of these obscur obscurations, the afflictive obscurations that I talked about at the beginning, and the cognitive obscurations. And there, these practices will help us to do that. Um, so the 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 Buddha figures and the subtle energies of the mantras represent the potential that all conscious beings have for generally positive qualities of loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom. And those qualities can be nurtured and cultivated and developed until they reach the full blossoming of magnificent love, kindness, compassion, and wisdom. The magnificent, those qualities, those magnificent qualities of an enlightened being. We have what they're saying is that we have, because we have this Buddha nature, this clear light mind, this clarity and awareness at the center of what we are, we have the potential to develop our good qualities to perfection. And we have the potential to remove all of the afflictive and, uh, and cognitive obscurations that are muddying up our clear light continuum. This is what we have the potential for. And this, is, this can happen only because consciousness is empty of any kind of inherent, independently self-existent nature. That's the reason why consciousness can change. Consciousnesses uh, interact with one another. We all know this. If we were all independently self-existent, there would be no way that we could hear the words I'm speaking, or that I could hear the words someone else is speaking, or that we could consciously relate to one another. We are Inter interdependent, interactive, interconnected consciousness. This is why the, um, the energies of the Buddhas uh, can connect with us. They can connect with us through these emanations of the various aspects of what enlightenment is about. 
They can connect with us through the energies of the mantras that they have given that, that generate the, uh, the energy that will affect our internal energetic winds. And so it, this is all due to our interdependent nature. If things existed, if things, if emptiness means nothing existed, this couldn't happen. Or if, if we believe that everything was independently self-existent, this couldn't happen. But because everything is dependently arising, is interconnected, this actually can happen and this will occur. So that's an important thing to remember. So here's, this is, this is interesting. Buddhas emanate Buddha figures, for instance, the, you know, the, the figure we looked at last week, say, of Buddha Shakyamuni. Buddhas emanate these Buddha figures as well as the subtle energies of the mantras from their clear light continuum. This is emanated from the clear light continuum of a Buddha. And they emanate it to benefit us, particularly by serving as embodied energies that represent the various factors of Buddha nature, such as Shakyamuni emanating uh, uh, the Buddha emanating as Shakyamuni, which is a, a which is embodies refuge. What refuge is about? When we take refuge, when we take a safe direction in our life, this is what that Buddha image is embodying, and the energies uh, that go with that. Um, uh, then, and the same with um, uh, wisdom and the union of compassion and wisdom, and all of that. These these various Buddha images are are reflecting all of those things for us. And as we work with those, we begin to understand <clears throat> how it works, what it is, what we're actually energetically doing with our own mental continuum to get to this point. <clears throat> analogy, an analogy for this process that might be helpful, <clears throat> which I, I gave last week, is if we think that the Buddha is like an expert coach and, is, and we as the practitioner are like a capable trainee, where both the coach and the trainee are working together to develop the trainee's potential for superior strength and stamina. Another more traditional analogy is uh, to think of the Buddha as an expert doctor. And we, as the protect practitioner, are like a well-informed patient with confidence in the doctor because we've checked the doctor out. In this analogy, both the doctor and the patient work together to increase the patient's potential for perfect health. In other words, the process that we're engaging in with these, with these mantras and the Buddha images is a, um, it is a co-dependently arising process. And we're engaging in a dependently co-arising interactive uh, relationship. It's not just, I'm imagining this out there and, and this, you know, there's no other consciousness there. No, no, there is. When we are calling on an enlightened being, and we're visualizing the aspects of various stages of enlightenment, the enlightened beings for sure are going to be there. They're going to be with us. They're going to help us. There is a connection going on. And this only can occur because things are dependently arising. So it's, it may take a while for us to, to, to get there, especially if we're very, if we're very internally focused and we're really down on ourselves because of something, we'll feel as if all that kind of connection is cut off. And that we, it's just important in that case to just say the mantra, just repeat the mantra until there's some kind of calmness going on. And then you can start to feel, you can open up and let the connection come. Otherwise, um, if we get too isolated in our mind, we're going to put a block to that. So that's another thing to think of because I experienced that myself. If I've gotten down on myself because of uh, particular behavior I've had, the mantras aren't, the, I don't feel the energy there. I don't right. feel it working because I'm blocking. I'm getting so self-absorbed. Right. I've, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten the whole point of the path, which is compassion, a, a path of compassion and a path of, path of wisdom combined. When I can finally get back there, then I can feel the energy uh, again flowing. I'm making a connection. Yeah. Aji mentioned this. And I think I had, I think maybe taking it for granted, but not everybody may know that nine cycle of breath exercise. You know, that, we'll do that later. We won't do that now. I'm just, yeah, in we'll, terms of 
you know, beginning, because we were taught to do that at the beginning of our meditation session, yeah. at the beginning of our session. I know, and we've done that several times. I'll do that when we get actually to okay. the garbage unit practice. Okay. All right, so... Um, Again, uh, and I'll say again, when we mentally imagine these uh, Buddha images, we should think of them not as coarse, uh, coarse, gross physical forms, but as brilliant, clear light, like a, like a brilliant rainbow, uh, those, those kinds of colors and that kind of form, um, that is light energy that, that we're visualizing, or imagining, imagining, I should say. Um, I think uh, Alexander Burson says it, it really is a process of... Uh, creative imagination and um, perhaps eventually one could develop a clairvoyance where you know you're actually you're really sort of seeing that out there in front of you uh, this happened with Sankapa where Manjushri eventually he appeared to him in this light body form and, him, and they could dialogue back and forth like that but that's not that's not what we should be expecting right off the bat so if you will just as a review just put up the Buddha image Shakyamuni Buddha and we'll start there. I know this takes a lot of, there's a lot of preparation in this, but without the proper preparation, the mantras will not be effective, as effective. So just to, um, just to uh, quickly go over this, this is Buddha Shakyamuni. As we're looking at this image, what this image represents represents is taking a safe direction in our life, taking safe refuge. This is the image when we we're saying, if you were saying the "I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha," you would be imagining this this image here. So the um, you have the starting at the very top, you have this Ushnisha, the top looks like a top protrusion in his in his head, and this. This is represented, uh, representative of the um, the spiritual, the vast spiritual power of an enlightened being. Um, it's located where the the crown chakra would be, and if you look, it looks like there's a little flame or a little um, illuminated jewel on top of that. That would be re representing that opening of the crown chakra. Mm -hmm. On some Buddhas, for instance, uh, uh, Buddhas from Thailand, you'll they'll actually have a the statues will actually have a flame shooting out of, of the top of the head. And this is representing this, this opening of the crown chakra. Um, so this, this is this um, supreme uh, consciousness that uh, is, is, has achieved complete omniscience and enlightenment. Uh, his peaceful face, the arched eyebrows, you look at the little white dot. This is spiritual insight that he has, mm -hmm. um, this, the face is peaceful, it's loving, kind, and wise. If you see his long earlobes, this is just a reminder <clears throat> that the Buddha used to have a life of um, privilege and leisure, and as a, as a um, royalty, he, had, he would wear jewelry and earrings, and his earlobes became very elongated because of that. And this is a reminder that he gave all of that up. He turned away from that to, to, to practice this path and achieve enlightenment. Uh, the gold color <clears throat> is high spiritual attainment. It's the kind of spiritual attainment that um, stands out in a world of distraction. That cold, they, they relate it to uh, how saffron, the, the uh, strands of saffron, mm -hmm. will stand out from the, everything around them. <clears throat> and then continuing going down, he's got his, he's got his uh, right arm touching the ground. This is the um, earth-touching mudra. This represents that he has... He has achieved complete control over all of uh, samsara and nirvana, that he has overcome all of the afflictive emotions, the afflictive obscurations, the cognitive obscurations. He has control. So when we're saying um, muni muni maha muni, it's talking about control over, over the suffering, the lower realms of samsara. The next muni, muni is talking about control over all of samsara itself. And Mahamuni is talking about great control over all of the subtle cognitive obscurations that, that block the, uh, obscure the omniscience of, an, of enlightenment. Um, his feet are in the lotus position, which is the perfect balance of the compassion wing and the wisdom wing of the, of the path. And on the bottom of his feet, there are these little 
Dharma mm-hmm. wheels, re- which repre- represent the paths, the the path of it's the eight noble, uh, eightfold noble path. It's the Mahayana path. It's all of the paths in Buddhism that bring you to happiness, liberation, and enlightenment. <clears throat> so that is that is just at a brief brief glance. Um, it's interesting. Um, uh, Alexander Berzin, he has a wonderful way he describes these. He describes these Buddha images as infographics. Mm-hmm. Because contained within these Buddha images are just all this information. Right. All of this information. So this is just some of the information that in this. In this. Uh, so what this is representing is this, is this safe refuge that we can take, safe direction we can take in our life, because the Buddha has achieved all of these things. The Buddha is going to teach us or teach us to do this ourselves. What, what? So I'm just laughing. I'm going, oh, this is a photograph of a... Oh, this is a photograph <laughs> of our... Yeah, I got on a ladder and took a picture of our <laughs> tanga. <laughs> I went, oh, I mean, this looks a lot like ours. Yeah, it's interesting. These little cameras work well. Um, <laughs> I know. And I was in the room with these. So, all right, let's now go over. Can you put up the, the mantra itself? It's just the, uh, what you call it, transliteration. Mm-hmm. There you go. So the mantra is Tayata Om Muni Muni Maha Muni Esvoha. So Tayata is just saying, this is how it is. This is how, thus it is. Uh, om, when you're saying Om, I, I kind of a, a mnemonic device that I use is it, think of omniscience. Because Om is referring to the, the, the body, speech, and mind that, has, that can become a Buddha. You know? So it's Om, think the, the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. So the body, it, it's a very interesting thing. The body of a of a Buddha, the Buddha exists kind of in a um, trans-dimensional state. So at the same time, the Buddha can, um, let me see if I, I got my notes on this. Yeah, it's a multi-dimensional nature of existence. They, they sometimes refer to it as the three bodies of the Buddha or the trikaya. So you have a, a Buddha that can emanate in this world so that we actually can see. So people will say, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is an emanation of the Buddha of compassion. So the Buddha, a Buddha can emanate in a form that, that we, we living as sentient beings in samsara can actually see and we can experience the benefit and effects and look at the look at the effect the Dalai Lama has actually had on the world. The beneficial effect. It's quite extraordinary. You know, and his whole life has been this way. So many, many people consider him to be an emanation of the of Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion. So that's one of the ways the Buddha can ma- manifest. The Buddha can also simultaneously manifest as what is called a um a light body, an enjoyment body. This is a body similar to the one that was in the in the uh, in the Buddha image, there. If you imagine that was just made out of light, right. pure light. That that kind of uh, Buddha can appear to highly realized bodhisattvas in in a kind of a realm that they call a, that is the Buddhist field of energy. Mm-hmm. It's not samsara. It's not like a samsaric realm. It's a Buddha kind of realm. And highly realized beings can be in this realm, and the Buddha can actually teach them in this light. A body, Stayed. yeah, and this is called the enjoyment body. <clears throat> and then the third way of Buddha simultaneously manifest is just the pure mind. The pure is called the Dharma Kaya. It's the it's, it's the pure consciousness of of the Buddha. So when we are, for instance, when we are doing these these mantras, there is a pure consciousness. We're calling on on the enlightened being. There's a pure consciousness of a Buddha who will be working with us. You know, it's a pure consciousness. It's um, it's like the it's like the clear light continuum itself uh, of a Buddha. It's they call it the Dharmakaya. It's just the mind, the mind of the Buddha. So that when that's all in the syllable Om. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So the Om. We we always say Om. It's a very religious word, and then they say it has. It's it's made of A U M and it has a vibrational effect yeah. on your body. Mm-hmm. So yeah. right. any Hindu mantras, any Buddhist mantra starts with mostly Om. Mm-hmm. And there's a way you say A U M Om. It has a vibrational effect on mm-hmm. your throat. Right. 
uh, chest and stomach. So mm -hmm. Om has a very, it's very mm -hmm. powerfully vibrational word that came from ancient times. That's mm -hmm. why it's a part of the mantra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the people people will just do Om. Yeah. Right. They will just do a, a meditation just on Om. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Om. Yeah. Om. Yes, there's a way to say the right. Om. Right. Aum. Aum. Mm -hmm. You can feel it. Vibration. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It ends up. It ends. It ends resonating here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's all of that. There's right. all of that. Three letters. Yeah. Three little letters. <laughs> Aum. Aum. And, and, and if you think of the Buddha as that, Aum. It's body's body, speech, speech mind. mind. You can yeah. think of it that way. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. Body, speech, and mind. Yeah. So that's that's all in um. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Then Muni. Muni yeah. means the, there, are, there are three Munis. There's a Muni, Muni, and then there's a Maha Muni. Maha means great. So there's Muni, Muni, and great Muni. So Muni <clears throat> is control over the suffering of the three lower, lower realms in samsara. This would be the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, the animal realm. The Buddha has has control, has controlled, not control over the realms, has controlled over that within himself. The Buddha will never be in those. He completely has control over those realms. In other words, the Buddha could go into those realms to be a benefit, but would not become part of that realm, has control over that, you know, control over the, the, the magn the magnetic, the gravitational pull of those realms. Mm -hmm. The Buddha is free of that, has control of that. The second Muna is control over the suffering of all of samsara and over all self-cherishing thoughts. The Buddha has no self-cherishing thoughts. They've completely been eradicated. Those are, those are, one of, those are some of the afflictive obscurations, completely eradicated, no self-cherishing thoughts. So that's, that's the second Muni. And the Maha Muni is he has great control over the suffering caused by the subtle illusions related to du the dualistic mind. And this mm -hmm. is getting into the idea that there is there's a subject, that I am the, the I, you know, I'm the subject, everything out there is the object. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not thinking that this is actually in a, our own appearance, our own right. karmic appearance. So this is very this is highly, That's huge. this is very high realization. This is the realization that will bring you to the omniscience of enlightenment. This is great Maha Muni. The Buddha has this. The Buddha has completely overcome all of that. All of that idea of subject object and the interaction as being all three different separate things. They have all merged together like the stereoscopic right, right. view. It's all come together. So this is when we're saying, Om, you know, this mm -hmm. Buddha, you know, the, the, the multi-dimensional aspect of a Buddha, Om, then Muni, the control, he's, he can go into these lower realms, but has complete control over them in terms of himself. Okay. The second Muni is all of samsara. Maha Muni is the removal of all of these obs afflictive obscurations, which we are seeing things as not as dualistic. Right. So, and then Swoha, Swoha is the final, and this is a, is a it's a term of blessing, and it's 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 kind of saying, <clears throat> may my mind receive, absorb, and keep the blessings of this mantra, and may these blessings um, take root in me and grow. Mm -hmm. So you're going Om Muni Muni Maha Muni Swaha. May I absorb this? Right. May I uh, take the blessings of these, and may these blessings grow take root and grow in me mm -hmm. so this is what we're saying so the thing the thing we'll just do this a little bit mm -hmm. you can uh, um you know you close your eyes you're imagining you could also if, if you can imagine this well you sort of keep your eyes slightly open sort of look down but i find it easier at this level that i'm at is to close my eyes and then i imagine <clears throat> in the space in front of me uh the buddha uh shakyamuni is there and then from, from your heart, uh, generate a request to the Buddha. Should I stop sharing? Huh? Should I stop sharing? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, from your heart.
So you have the the Buddha image there, sort of you're imagining it's there in front of you, kind of, you know, the best you can based on how much you've looked at it. And from your heart, you generate the request to the Buddha that you be inspired to follow the path to full enlightenment, the full Mahayana path, the full Bodhisattva path to enlightenment. Make the request from your heart that you be inspired to follow it. Then you make this request on behalf of all living beings who are trapped in the cycle of samsara. You're making the request on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Then rays of light stream from the figure of the Buddha before you. Okay, so you got the streams of light going. This light then enters your body and quickly removes all negativities, obscurations, and hindrances, freeing you to progress quickly on the path. Imagine that this light from the Buddha flows not only to you, but to all living beings situated in space all around you. Imagine that they all receive the inspiration of the Buddha and the Buddha's blessings as you recite this name mantra of Shakyamuni Buddha. So let's just do this a few times with that visualization going. Om Muni Muni Maha Muni Swaha. 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 So there's a lot going on there, but you the the more that you do this, the more you um, get clear with the what you're imagining this whole the the rays of light coming from the buddha um the sentient beings around you the meaning the meaning of the the mantra itself the energy that's contained in that meaning the more you become familiar with this the stronger it gets and the you can go om muni muni maha muni om muni and you create kind of a rhythm mm -hmm. of energy in your within your being within right. your energetic body a rhythm begins to go and it has all of these aspects to it so right. you feel you're, you're feeling very much connected to all sentient beings you're right. feeling very much connected you're feeling that this is this is the path mm -hmm. that, that i will take this is the safest path i will take it will bring me all the way to enlightenment i will develop my compassion and wisdom to the utmost levels so that i can be a benefit to all of these beings so you're so you yourself then your own clear clear light mental continuum is beginning to embody this mm -hmm. this is this is this is the point here it's not that the buddha is giving it to us the buddha is like a trainer showing us this is what you do this is what this is what i did right and so this is what you can do too and you begin to embody that yourself you know, not that you're already a Buddha, but you're you're in training, mm -hmm. and so you're beginning to to feel this, and and it will it will have an effect on you. It will have an effect on how you interact with the animals in your yard or on your kitchen counter. Right, right. You know, it will have an effect. So that's that's just an example there. Um, let's now now go to uh, put up uh, Chenerezi. Put up that infographic. <laughs> oh, the picture of him. Yeah, the picture. The picture of Chenerezi. The infographic. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Alexander Berzin is funny. Yeah. <laughs> but he's right. That's what it is. Cont contained in this, this image here is all of this information. Yeah. Right. And especially if you have if you have this on your phone, if you've downloaded these to the phone or you're looking at, at the computer, you get more of the sense of light. 
if you look on it, if you're just looking on a printed, you know, printed you piece of paper, you don't get the, the sense of light coming through. So this actually helps with the um, the, the the imagining. Yeah. So here we have um, Chen Rezi. Now Chen Rezi represents is a representation, an aspect of the Buddha that represents the compassion wing of the path to enlightenment. The compassion wing, which we talk about, compassion is is at the root of all the Buddha's teachings. There is no spiritual path without compassion. <clears throat> so the uh, the mantra, I'll just it's one that's quite well known. It's Om Mani Padme Hum. So Om again is the is this sort of um, if you think of the the body and speech and mind of a Buddha and what that represents, this universal, um, you know, this this mm -hmm. this way of um, this way that you can become. So this is this is um, Chenrezig now. Om, this this Buddha of of compassion. Mani means jewel, and if you look uh, in uh, Chenrezig has four arms and hands. Mm -hmm. And in the two central hands, in between those hands, he's holding mm -hmm. a jewel. This jewel, well, the whole mantra is Om Mani Padme, which means uh, lotus, Hum, which is Hum represents, all right, so Om is, is the is Buddha of compassion we're talking about here, that we ourselves are, are trying to develop <clears throat> this within ourselves. Mani is this jewel. Padme is the lotus, so it's the jewel that is in the lotus. So they talk about, if you look uh, on, on uh, Chen Rezig's, in Chen Rezig's left hand, he's holding, holding up a, a blue, a lotus, a blossoming lotus. So the, um, he's got the jewel and the lotus is there. So the jewel represents our um, clear light mind. It is our Buddha nature, basically. It is the, the Buddha, it's the clear light mind that if we remove all of our obscurations, the afflictive obscurations, the cognitive obscurations, this jewel of what our mind actually is, our consciousness is, uh, can rise out of all of the, the muddy, swampy muck of samsara and become this beautiful blossoming lotus. You know, it's the jewel that's in the lotus. So... Chenrezig's four arms and hands represent the four immeasurables that we that we um, recited earlier uh, before class. It is immeasurable love. May all beings be happy. That is immeasurable love. That's one of the central hands. The next one is immeasurable compassion. May all beings be free from suffering. That's the next one. So Chenrezig is holding the Buddha nature, our clear light mind with love and compassion, holiness. So if we think, if we were to think of a trainer training us how to think, how we can become compassionate, that we think of everyone has this, this Buddha nature in them. Everyone has this clear light consciousness. It is the jewel that exists within our consciousness that if we, if it can be developed properly, it can rise out of all of the mucky stuff of samsara and become this magnificent being. So we're holding this, you know, with love and compassion in our hands, this, this Buddha nature, our own Buddha nature and others' Buddha nature. Then we have um, uh, oh. kind of compassion, immeasurable joy. Immeasurable joy is the wish that beings be happy always with no suffering whatsoever. So if you look at um, Shakyamuni's, I mean, uh, Chen Rezig's right hand, it's the one that, as we're looking at, it looks like it's on the left, but it's mm -hmm. right hand. He's got a mala. Oh, yeah. It's a crystal, a mala made of crystal. <coughs> and crystal, of course, has significance for, for um, its ability to uh, generate communication or, or um, make communication. You know, they use it in computers. It has to do with uh, a transfer of communication. So the... Um, the, the Chen Rezig is counting. It's just moving, moving these beads, moving the crystal beads. It's sort of like there's never a moment where Chen Rezig is not um, wanting the benefit, the, the happiness of all sentient beings, that they may always be happy, always be free from suffering. This is the motivation. This is the intention of the Buddha of, of compassion. So again, holding that 
with love and compassion, holding that uh, the Buddha nature that we all have with love and compassion, and never, not for a moment, not wanting to be a benefit, constantly, mm -hmm. constantly being a benefit. The, the beads are always going constantly. The next, and, the, and then in the... Um, it's in a figure eight. Mm, yeah. yeah, it is. They've got it in a figure eight. In infinity. Infinity. <clears throat> right. I'll tell you, uh, once I was able to do the, sit in the lotus position, that, that they're all sitting in this lotus mm -hmm. position uh, for the most part, I think. Um, <clears throat> Once I was once able to do that and hold it for a while, and the energy that began to, I could feel a figure eight happening. It was some kind of figure eight energy. So well, I don't know what it means, but the, right. but this is also, the, the, he's got this in a kind of a figure eight. So then the other hand, the, um, the left hand is then holding uh, this lotus, okay? So this is the fourth one, is the immeasurable equanimity. So no matter who, we're talking about it could be someone in a hell realm, someone in a God realm. It doesn't matter as a Buddha of compassion, there's equanimity for all. Um, so this is this, this also comes with the, with the jewel in the Lotus, the Lotus blossoming is this equanimity for all beings. May all beings be happy. May, um, may, may be, they be free of attachment and aversion that holds some close and others distance. So a Buddha of compassion would Go to any realm, go to a hell realm and appear and help beings in the hell realm. Would go to a god realm, help beings in a hot god realm. Would go to an animal realm, help beings in the animal realm. Would appear in whatever form would be a benefit to help. There's, there's just this immeasurable equanimity that we, we ourselves want to develop. So as we think, if we're thinking that uh, Chen Rezig is being a coach, a trainer for us, we can imagine that these energies, as we're saying this mantra, Chen Rezig is out of in front of us, but we can also imagine that we ourselves are holding everyone's, their, 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 their clear light consciousness. We're holding that with love and compassion. We know that it's there. We constantly want to be a benefit, never not be a benefit. Always keep that. That's what I want to be, a benefit. And hold and have this equanimity that no matter who they are, you know, they could be who I think of the worst person in the world, but still they have that Buddha nature. I want to benefit them. How can I help? Like that. And you mm -hmm. begin to embody mm -hmm. this yourself as you say this, this mantra. So let's say this for, for a little bit. So imagine the, imagine Chen Rezi uh, in the space in front of you. Imagine all those, those qualities holding, holding the jewel between the hands of love and compassion, constantly with, with the uh, right hand, constantly, constantly wishing to be a benefit. You know, that's the meaning of the mama. And then in the left hand, holding that lotus, this equanimity, that no matter who it is, we want to be a benefit. So think of this ourselves. Imagine ourselves being this way, that we could embody this, that is possible. So we'll say this mantra a few times. Om Mani Padme, 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 so you really can get in into this and you can oh my and you you get a rhythm going of the energy going you you imagine yourself actually how could you embody this energy yourself? How could you bring this kind of energy out into your daily life? Right. You know, when you, when you look at your, the person you love most to hate, imagine that you're holding the, yeah. their jewel, the jewel of their clear light mind in your love and in your compassion. What does that feel like? How does that change? How does that change how you view them? And then imagine all you want to do is to be a benefit. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who they are. It is, it's powerful. And it's, if we embody this, then Chen Rezig will become very real for us. And the power and the, the essence of Chen Rezig will become very real for us. 
and we can access that and work on that and develop that ourselves. Not like we're, oh, please, please help me. Show me how. Show me how you did this. Show me how to do this. I want to be able to do this. And so this is how they become quite powerful. I think we probably have to. All right, let's do the last four minutes. Let's do, if you put up my jushri. And that's good, because Dr. Sattva will, will take us to um, Nagarjuna's practice. So if you put up the uh, infographic, <laughs> the Buddha image of um, Manjushri. So Manjushri is this, um, you know, this color, it looks a little kind of like a dull orange, but His Holiness says, is, imagine this is this saffron, this orange color, as if the, the sunlight is brilliantly shining on it and it is reflecting back at you this, this brilliant orange color, okay? And that um, Manjushri, they, they say it's like a 16-year-old in the form of a young. There's, there's, a, there's a youthfulness to Manjushri, an energy and youthfulness to Manjushri. In Manjushri's um, right hand, over sort of raised up over his head, there is a uh, double-edged sword, two-edged sword. And if you'll notice, if you look closely at that, there is a flame that starts towards the towards uh, in, in the middle, the right, the midpoint of the double-edged sword, and then it goes and it wraps around that sword until it, envel it envelops both sides of the sword in this big flame. And the sword itself, the double edges then come to a single point. So this is showing, what, what he's showing here is the, the non-duality, you could say of, um, you could say of the wisdom aspect of the path and the compassion aspect of the path. You could say the non-duality of conventional existence and ultimate existence. It's this idea that when you understand emptiness, you will understand that emptiness pervades everything and that, that for instance, compassion wing and empty and the wisdom wing, they come together exactly, like I said, like the uh, like a hologram, like a, the two pictures merge together and they form the, what we could call the non-dual, the non-dual image, the, the hologram of what, what this path is. So this is what it's showing, that the wisdom, the wisdom is capable of, we're taking these two aspects of the path, wisdom, compassion, and we're able to see the non-duality of it, how they work together in perfect balance, perfect harmony. So this also would be, we would be able to see, for instance, say something like a cup, and we would not only see the cup, but we would see the emptiness of the cup at the same time. Mm -hmm. We would see the conventional reality that we all, you know, we, we, we make the decision, this is a cup. And then we'd also see that that was empty of any kind of independent existence on its own. We'll get way more into this later on, but just, to, just think that this is the sword is representing the ability to be able to see this way, to see right. clearly that. Um, then in his left hand, there's a stem of a lotus that's right at his heart. You know, the, the center of the conscious, the center of the clear light mind. And the, the stem is coming out and then blossoming into a lotus at his uh, left ear. And in the middle, the opening of the lotus, the blossom, is a book that is wrapped up. And this book that is, a, is the Prajnaparamita, the, um, the perfection of wisdom, the perfection of wisdom sutra that the Buddha gave. So we're talking about the perfection of wisdom here, which we were talking about earlier. We have to have this perfection of wisdom in order for, for this non-dual appearance of compassion and wisdom to come together and to be very effective. So when we're thinking of um, Manjushri, we can think of the, those aspects, that what we are developing in the wisdom wing is this ability to understand what emptiness means, to understand the nature of emptiness, and then eventually to remove all of our cognitive obscurations that are in our clear light mind. Remember, he's, he's, the stem is coming from the place in the body where they say the clear light mind, the essence of the clear light mind abides. The essence of our consciousness is, is, is at the heart. So this is what we're getting with um, Manjushri. So let's just for, do a little bit of Om A Rapat Samadhi. So we have Om again, a Om. That, that word, that, that's the, the body, speech, mind, and the I wonder why they don't translate it, puns real literate it as A-U-M. 
in these translating uh, Yeah, because maybe everybody would go would be confused as to and then go aum, aum, aum or something like that. Yeah. Instead of aum, aum. So om is a close transliteration, I guess. <laughs> We won't go into Arapatsanadi, what they're standing for, and anything, everything, but it uh, has to do with um, the perfection of wisdom. So, Om Arapats, Arapatsanadi. And so we say this um, as many times as possible when we're, when we're doing it uh, you know, on our own. That's only one D. This is. Right. And, it, and it, you, all, you only say one D until the very last time that you're going to say this. And then you go, Om Arapatsanadi. And it's focusing that. It's focusing that sharply focusing that wisdom energy okay so just picture picture manjushri you know in the space in front of you that brilliant orange you know his right hand is holding the flaming sword over his head which represents the non-dual nature of of reality really and then his uh left hand is holding the, the stem of the lotus and up to his left ear, ear is the Prajnaparamita Sutra. So for ourselves, he's training us to think that we can cut through, we can cut through our delusions of self and other, of, um, yeah, we can cut through our ego self-grasping delusions that make us feel separate from everything else. We can, we can see the non-duality of of our being and our connection with all other all other things, our interdependent connection with everything, and and the way that we can do this is by understanding. And so this is going into our left ear, understanding the wisdom realizing emptiness, understanding the Buddha's teachings on emptiness. So we think this think of this that Manjushri is coaching us in this way, as we as we say this mantra, and we won't do this too many times. Om Arapatsanadi, 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 Om Omar of the So when you're doing this on your own, you could easily do a whole mala of the of the and then and I, and I've seen when the and the monks and his holiness the Dalai Lama are saying this this mantra when they get to the di, 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 they do the whole mala of they do the whole mala. Wow. Um, so in, in, as again, like like all of the other practice. ones, the more we practice this, the more we get into a rhythm ourselves, our own rhythm of how we are saying this mantra, you know, the speed, the tone, all of that. And remember that the energy. Even if you don't say it out loud, at least mm -hmm. whisper, get your tongue and your mouth moving in the air for them. Mm -hmm. Not that it's not beneficial to just think it in your mind, right. but to actually get the energies going, you get you move the winds. Right. Okay? The sound. And the more you do this, the more you'll get into a rhythm, the more you will feel the energy begin to move. You know? mm -hmm. And especially if you think that you're in training, that these Buddhas, these aspects of what a Buddha is, they're showing you how you can be, what you need to do to achieve this. And so if you imagine yourself doing this as well, you will then embody it. It will be very easy for you to remember. It will be very easy to go, oh yeah, the wisdom, the wisdom, it's in my air. I, I need to understand. I need to understand wisdom. I need to recognize the non-dual nature of reality. Right. Um, so this really helps a lot. So think of it like, you know, you're in training, the Buddhas are coaching you, and this is what we're doing. All right. <laughs> any any, any questions before we close? We'll get to the next, final mantra when we when we get to uh, Nagarjuna's practice on um, karma. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. I know I have the sun. Oh. So we'll do the. Um, 
English and Our regular dedication prayers. Yeah, with these ones that are all the ones that are in the... Uh, yeah, we'll do the English first and then the Tibetan, but, it, you know. English once, Tibetan once, okay. May the precious body mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Jang Chu Sen Cho Rin Bo Che Ma Ke Pa Nam Ke Pyur Chi Ke Pa Nam Pa Me Pa Yang Long Me Gong Yu Pa Wang Shu The next one we're, we're saying may, may, um, may our understanding of emptiness continue to arise and grow. Mm -hmm. So let's read that in English. May the view of emptiness not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And then the final dedication at the bottom of the last page, page three. In all my lives, may I not be separated from true laws and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma, fully perfecting the virtues of levels and paths. May I speedily attain the state of Vajrayana. Okay, we will uh, close this out. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Arthur, did you get Mama Prasad's message?